death toll on the African island nation of Comoros rises as the country struggles to restore power in the wake of Cyclone Kenneth. Burkina Faso is plagued with problems on the road to justice for terrorism. We'll explain. And the African Union tells Sudan's military council to hand power to civilians within 60 days. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. The death toll from Cyclone Kenneth on the African island nation of Comoros has now climbed to four people, with at least 182 people injured. The overall impact of the powerful storm has affected more than 41,000 people in the country. Cyclone Kenneth slammed into Comoro a week ago, causing immense damage to the country. Many homes were destroyed and trees were uprooted. Volunteers are sending relief supplies to affected villages to help the local population cope with the dire situation. The cyclone has also caused widespread power outages across the nation, but power companies are working feverishly to restore electricity. To help citizens uh, suffering from the disaster, Comorian President Azali Zumani issued an emergency letter stating that 10 percent of their March salaries Will, with, will be withheld from all civil servants and employees of state-owned companies. Tropical Cyclone Kenneth, the second major cyclone to slam Mozambique in roughly a month, continues to challenge rescue and relief efforts there. And in the Comoros, where the storm hit before coming ashore on April 25th as a Category 4 storm in Mozambique's Cabo Delgado province, the second cyclone's direct impact affects nearly 250,000 people in northeast Mozambique. First, with the battering of its huge winds that destroyed homes, farms, and the area's infrastructure. But even though Kenneth came ashore days ago, it continues to damage the region, as explained by International Federation of the Red Cross spokesperson, Corey Battler. The flooding that comes afterwards is often an even worse disaster. And that is our biggest fear right now. We really are in the middle of a disaster as torrential rain continues, uh, even five days after this tropical storm. We've heard even from families who, uh, who may have been able to weather the, the storm of the cyclone when it first hit, but are now experiencing massive flood flooding. Uh, so it's displacing more people. Many more lives are at risk. As what happened when tropical cyclone Idai hit southern Mozambique, the cyclone Kenneth is making rescue, recovery and relief efforts extremely difficult as areas are rendered very isolated or completely impassable. Along with providing immediate humanitarian response, Butler details how the IFRC and others are also fighting the outbreak of diseases unleashed by the destruction of sanitation. They're cooking out in the open uh, and, and in areas where it may not be completely sanitary. So volunteers are also helping in terms of making sure that families are preparing uh, and, and preventing uh, future challenges where there could be, uh, for example, outbreaks of, of diseases. We've seen this with Cyclone Adai, where an outbreak of cholera came just weeks after, cyclone, after the cyclone hit. And we are anticipating, we, we worry that this could be a, a challenge again in this, in this disaster as well. So when we see the ICRC joins the UN World Food Programme in voicing concern that because tropical cyclone Kenneth, like Idai, came just as crops were getting ready for harvest, and now because of massive inland flooding, crop plants needed to sustain Mozambique's population cannot be planted. Because of this, relief groups say uh, food and other aid will have to pour into this country and surrounding areas for months to come until the land can once again produce food. Now, despite America's worldwide counterterrorism efforts, U.S. officials say the United States alone cannot defeat insurgencies. It needs reliable partners to protect people from attacks and prevent them from reoccurring. That's why the U.S. has tripled security assistance to Burkina Faso, one of several West African nations battling extremists. In the final report of our three-part series on Burkina Faso, VOS Kalabab reports U.S. officials are having to overcome some big challenges as they try to improve the country's law enforcement. This looks like the government of Burkina Faso's worst nightmare. In an instant, 
A friendly game in the capital, Ouagadougou, turns into a terror zone. Luckily, this scene is just a drill. Don't get caught. Organized and funded by the United States and international allies. U.S. Ambassador to Burkina Faso Andrew Young tells VOA this type of practice is crucial after a 2016 attack on Burkina Faso's capital exposed several weaknesses. A response that wasn't up to the standards of the Burkina Faso people. Uh, partners like the United States and France helped end that terrorist attack. Hey! Officials say drills like this one have improved local law enforcement's ability to repel attacks, protect civilians, arrest suspected terrorists, and when that is done... We have to save the scene and not destroy the evidence. Here's what they do. They mark each piece of evidence first. Then they take a picture of it and they log everything in order to build a criminal case. So we move from battlefield to custody, chain of custody, judicial process to accountability through the rule of law system. That's the key to uh, success of the long term. But the U.S. Embassy's regional security officer, Rosie Sandino, says there's a major hitch in that system. Terrorism cases are not going to trial. So here in Burkina Faso, we, there are a lot of um, terrorism cases. And one of the challenges is that they haven't been able to prosecute a case just yet. Sources familiar with Burkinabe terrorism cases tell VOA there are about 400 cases involving nearly 200 terror suspects imprisoned in Burkina Faso with no set trial date. Certainly waiting trial indefinitely is, is not acceptable. The government of Burkina Faso has not returned VOA request for comment. In response to the pileup, the U.S. Embassy has sent over a prosecutor from the Department of Justice to help the Burkinabe build and try these cases. There will be some, some progress that can be visible not only within the, the government, but the population can see that their system does work. But since the U.S. legal advisor just arrived last month, it's unclear precisely when the people of Burkina Faso will finally see justice. Carla Babb, VOA News, Ouagadougou. Sudanese, uh, Sudanese demonstrators and the African Union continue to apply pressure to the nation's military rulers to hand over power to a civilian-led transition authority within 60 days. In a statement, the U.S. the AU says it noted with deep regret that the military had not stepped aside and given power to civilians within a 15-day period set by the AU last month. The Continental Body says the 60 days were a final extension for Sudan's transition of military council to turn over power to civilians. Sudanese protesters fortified all entrances to a sit-in camp in front of Khartoum's defense ministry complex on Tuesday as military rulers signaled they were ready to negotiate with the opposition and call for an end to the unrest. Demonstrators piled up rocks and pieces of broken fencing to form barricades at all entrances to the city. Uh, the military council says it is committed to negotiations over the political future of the country, but says there should be no further unrest beyond Tuesday, a reference to protests uh, uh, disrupting train service and bridge traffic. Now, Sudanese student Allah Salam has become a symbol of the country's uprising against former President Omar al-Bashir. After a photo and video of her emerged on April 10th, in the images, Salah is standing on a car in a white traditional dress, chanting with protesters. The military ousted Bashir just one day later. But while Salah's image brought attention to Sudan's demonstrations and the frontline role of women, some, including Salah herself, say she has been inflated as an icon of the revolution. Rud Almendalp reports from Khartoum. The image of 22-year-old Alaa Salah chanting to Sudan's protesters from the roof of a car quickly went viral. Picked up by international media, Salah was dubbed a symbol of Sudan's revolution and the role of women in the uprising. Salah tells VOA she got caught up in the moment and her time in the spotlight was not planned. It began when I was in the revolution area and found a group of girls there behind the car. Then I asked the girls whether I could cheer them. I climbed on the car and chanted and cheered with them. Sudan's female protesters found their voice after three decades of oppression under President Omar al-Bashir's Islamist rule. 
In Sudan, life was very difficult in the period of al-Bashir. He destroyed the life of the people. The military ousted Bashir just a day after Salah's image went viral. But not all of Sudan's protesters welcomed Salah as a symbol of their struggle. Salah is one of the protesters, but of course she's not the icon of the revolution of Sudan. Uh, many people who died for this, they, they, they deserve to be icons more than her. But many, like 24-year-old Nesrim El Zarim, still admire Salah for bringing global attention to Sudan. She's a courage girl because it, it needs a lot of uh, courage to, to stand up like she did, she did and, and to motivate the people like she did. And uh, um, for me, I think she's lucky because, they're, they're, I mean, sometimes you were in the right place doing the right thing with the right camera. And that's what happened with her. As for Salah herself, she takes a humbler view of her role in Sudan's uprising. I am just one of the million demonstrators. They went out to demand freedom, change, justice and peace. It's not necessary anymore to climb on a car. I can be in any place to cheer with the people. As they struggle forward from authoritarian rule, the role that Salah and other women played in Sudan's revolution will not be forgotten. Ruth Almendorp for VOA News, Khartoum. Now, as the South Africa's May 8th general election approaches, many voters say they are cynical and fed up with the long-time ruling African National Congress. As South Africa marks 25 years of ANC rule, the, that sentiment appears to have also spread to the areas it has long considered safe, the countryside. Viewers Anita Powell has more. Every five years, residents of this rural South African community say the ruling party comes out here and asks for their vote. And in every one of the last four general elections, the majority of residents have voted for the African National Congress, allowing the party to maintain a comfortable majority in rural South Africa. But this year, that changes, say rural voters. Olga Fakazi said she voted for the ANC in 2014. But disgusted by corruption and poor service, Fakazi plans to boycott the polls. They're just like concentrating on all these big towns, but here in the rural places, they're not even coming. They don't come into us. They're not coming to us. So I, I don't see why I should vote for the ANC. Really, I'm not going to vote for the ANC. Mataba Mokopane, a resident of this remote, dry corner of northwest South Africa, says she plans to do the same. The people we are voting for, actually, uh, when we finish voting for them, they don't look after the community anymore. Analysts say they are among a growing demographic of disillusioned ANC supporters. Many are turning to opposition parties like the Democratic Alliance or the Economic Freedom Fighters. But many others are simply staying away. Just because the ANC numbers might go down doesn't mean that the urban areas have swung to opposition parties. The ANC has got an internal opposition in terms of the voters not voting because they're dissatisfied with the ANC, their party of choice. In the farming town of Volmerenstad, unemployed voter Tsepo Mosweu says he has lost hope the ANC will bring improvements since the death of ANC icon Nelson Mandela, known by many South Africans simply as Tata. People, ANC failed us. This morning, we are going to vote for EFM. It's either we go for DA or MF, but we must change because of Tata leave a legacy for us. But what about us? There's a rate of unemployment, there's a rate of poverty, there's a rate of... Look at this road here. But the hope for change is alive in the nearby town of Blumhof. We as the, as the opposition, we only need to work very hard to show these people that they've, they've been used from 1994 until now, only for the benefits of certain families. So they are starting to see light, and I do have hope that uh, sooner or later the oppositions will also take power here in Blumo. Will that happen, or will the rural areas stand by the ruling party? South Africa finds out on May 8th. Anita Powell, VOA News, Northern Cape, South Africa. Well, International Workers' Day, more commonly known as May Day, is being observed worldwide in more than 80 countries. 
governments have es es escalated security, increasing police presence, and some are using drones to monitor crowds expected at huge May Day rallies in major cities. Police in Kampala arrested three members of the Kampala Arcade Traders Association who demonstrated against the National Labor Day celebrations in the Agago district in northern Uganda. In neighboring Kenya, police used tear gas in an attempt to disperse uh, protesters who stormed the Labor Day event in Nairobi. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We also stream our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, Democratic Representative Elhan Omar and President Donald Trump exchange barbs. But first, a look at Wednesday's headlines. of 165 pages, the CAS panel expressed some serious concerns as to the future practical application of these DSD regulations. Vincent Macquarie inviting you to the new look Africa 54 premiering soon. Same great team, but with new energy and a new host, Esther Gibui Ewart. Hi and welcome. We'll bring you a closer look at politics, technology, health, and so much more, backed by VOA correspondents across Africa and the world, including perspectives from Washington, D.C., and Africans achieving abroad. Same time, same channels. Stay tuned. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar from the U.S. state of Minnesota says she is not intimidated by President Donald Trump attacking her patriotism. Omar is a former Somali refugee and one of the first Muslim women elected to Congress. Africa 54, this ticket that you want has our story. Voters in Omar's home state of Minnesota are divided over comments she has made suggesting that U.S. lawmakers' support for Israel is influenced by political donations. She has also been criticized for remarks about Muslim Americans losing civil liberties after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks because, in her words, quote, some people did something. President Donald Trump condemned those comments on Twitter with more than 40 seconds of video from the attacks and a large graphic of the words we will never forget. Campaigning in Minnesota, President Trump told a local television station that Congresswoman Omar is unpatriotic. She's been very disrespectful to this country. She's been very disrespectful, frankly, to Israel. She is somebody that uh, doesn't really understand, I think, life, real life, what it's all about. It's unfortunate. She's got a, uh, a way about her that's very, very bad, I think, for our country. I think she's extremely unpatriotic and extremely disrespectful to our country. After meeting with Somali leaders in Minnesota, Congresswoman Omar told VOA that she will not back down from criticizing Mr. Trump. This president and his supporters believe that we don't have right to stay here. They have been fighting against us since 2015. But now, when a Muslim woman who is black, immigrant, and refugee gets a chance, we don't have fear from them. We have to challenge them. I have to use my seat and leverage to represent the voices of those who elected me, those who have been crying and demonstrating in the streets 
to get an, an opportunity to have representatives at the U.S. capital. We can say no to the president's strong policies. I was not elected to remain still like a self-portrait and think that I'm protecting my seat. And I believe I'm in a legitimate fight and I hope I will win it. Congresswoman Omar and President Trump are both up for re-election in 2020, and political analysts say Minnesota will be an important state in deciding nationwide contests. As to Gido Ewart, VOA News, Washington. Heavy fighting continues in Libya as the forces of General Khalifa Haftar attempt to seize Tripoli from the Government of National Accord. Haftar's forces had controlled much of the country's east, but last month began a push into the capital where the United Nations-backed GNA is based. Correspondent Heather Murdoch is in Tripoli covering the fighting. And a few hours ago, she spoke from the front lines with VOA's Kate Pound Dawson about what she is saying. I'm here about uh, less than 100 meters from the front line where soldiers from the Western, uh, Western Libya government of national accord are fighting with the soldiers of Khalifa Haftar, who uh, about three weeks ago announced he was planning on taking over Tripoli. Since he came here a little more than three weeks ago, he has not gotten into the city, but there is more or less a stalemate going on in the suburbs where there is fighting every day. And while uh, on Monday, Haftar's forces did move forward, they were also on the same day moved back. Since then, they have pretty much maintained the line, but there has been fighting every evening along with airstrikes every evening. Um, the displaced, there are about 42,000 people have been displaced from this conflict, but recently soldiers say that people are not coming out of the conflict because the people who are still there after all this time really have no place to go. Um, I can see ambulances coming out of the war zone and some uh, cars coming in. And just a few minutes ago, there was pretty heavy fire, but it seems to have quieted down for the moment. Is any aid getting in to both areas where there's combat and then just to the city in general, medical aid, food supplies, those sorts of things? Sure. Aid going to uh, makeshift refugee camps or displacement camps in schools, um, but a lot of it is not international aid, it's local aid. Um, and one of the things the aid workers here complain about is that they get international aid, but it's often not what they need. Like they'll get tents, but they don't need tents in the city of Tripoli. They have plenty of shelter. They need uh, extra food and, uh, you know, and funds to supply electricity and water. So far, what are the GNA? Uh, troops telling you about their experience, what they have seen as they fought? Their experience so far is they're surprised at how brutal this fight has been. They say that Hafter's forces are bringing heavy weapons into the city, and some of it I've even seen. On Saturday night, there were airstrikes right in the city, and there were huge drones flying overhead. Um, they say that uh, the fighting is pretty brutal, and they're pretty scared for the civilians on both sides of the front lines. Now, for years, Facebook said it wanted to be the world's digital town square. Now, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook's uh, CEO, has a more intimate vision, the digital living room, enabling private conversation between people and groups. The company spelled out how it is changing at its annual developer event in San Jose, California. Michelle Quinn reports. At Facebook's developer conference, CEO Mark Zuckerberg says the social media company is shifting focus from the digital town square to a more private place. In addition to the digital town square, we also need a digital equivalent of the living room that is just as built out as a platform with all of the different ways that we want to interact privately with messaging and small groups and sharing where the content doesn't stick around forever, uh, simple and secure payments, private ways to share your location, and over time, lots of more different ways uh, to interact privately. With more than one billion users, Facebook has come under fire worldwide for how it's handled user data and how it monitors extreme views on its site. Zuckerberg told conference goers, Facebook is changing to focus on private messaging, a rapidly growing area, as well as encrypting Instagram and Messenger, two of its main services, so that communication can't be seen by others, even by Facebook. 
all type of technology. There has to be some kind of involvement. And then I believe that there can be security measures that can be put in place. I think that technology can be used for good. The, the part of the encryptation is very important for us because, for example, we want to uh, provide some communication, private communication with our final users in order to provide information about our products for, for example, pricing or details or something like that. With Facebook, people talk about the negative, but for me as a social worker, I work with nonprofits. A lot of nonprofits have no access to technology that allow them to do the job that they need to do, especially reach out to clients and have this community process. And with Facebook, it allows these nonprofits to engage without the need to expense their monies, which they don't have in the first place, to engage with the clients. Zuckerberg says he wants Facebook to be a force for good in the world, a place where users can move easily from the town center to a living room, to a space where interest groups can meet. Not just the big moments, right, the social movements, the breakthroughs, but also all the everyday good, the emotional support, the, the jokes with friends, the, the feeling of being together with your family, both in private and in public, the living room and our town squares. Still unclear is whether Facebook's changes will resonate with users and help the company sidestep controversy in the future. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, San Jose, California. And here's what's trending now. What Ixon Adire and fellow musician James and Namani are on a radio show in Lagos today to promote their music. The two artists, who both grew up in a crowded, shanty town in Nigeria's central Benue state, are building solo careers but occasionally create music together. Artists who sing and rap over electronic backing trucks in a center in a genre known as Afrobeat. I've seen their popularity in Nigeria surge into record sales and sold out concerts across Africa and in both Britain and the United States. Well, and finally, French label Christian Dior crisscrossed cultures and continents at its first fashion show in Morocco with beaded dresses and patent prints taking center stage. And usually for the French label, it commissioned an Abidjan based firm to manufacture the cloth which in its most elaborate form is printed on two sides. The fabrics found across West Africa and showcasing symbols that are sometimes used as a form of language had inspired the collection. Designers uh, Pate Wedrogo or Patio from Burkina Faso, who is known for dressing Nelson Mandela, also worked with Dio on pieces for the show, among other collaborators, and that's what's trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching, and we wish you a very good night. See you back here tomorrow, same time.